Uh, good morning and welcome to the Washington Foreign Press Center's briefing on transatlantic relations and the war in Ukraine, the road to the Washington summit. My name is Zena Wolfington and I'm the uh, moderator today. The briefing is on the record and we will post a transcript of this briefing later today on fpc.state.gov. Our briefer today is Peter Rao, Senior Fellow and Director of the Center on Europe and Eurasia at Hudson Institute. He is an independent subject matter expert and the views expressed by briefers are not affiliated with the Department of State, um, are their own and do not necessarily reflect those of the U.S. government. Peter Rao will start us off with opening remarks and after his remarks I will open the floor for questions. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Senior Fellow Rao. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you all for being here. Um, hello to those of you who are joining online. Uh, it's a great privilege and honor to be here. And I thought I would just begin with a few opening remarks on the NATO summit itself, almost in staccato style, a few unrelated points. And then from there, move to the broader geopolitical situation before turning it over to uh, you all for questions. So perhaps just to begin and almost to state the obvious, this will commemorate the Washington summit to be held in July, 75 years of alliance. And uh, it really is an opportunity, I think, for President Biden to uh, bask in the glow of 31 other allies, as well as many other partners who will be traveling, welcoming them to Washington and showcasing the American multilateral alliance system in Europe. Uh, because of that, though, I would say that there are also a few uh, almost downside risks which we should uh, pay attention to and closely observe as we report on uh, the summit and the lead up to it and observe its proceedings. The first is to be sure that this is an American summit rather than uh, just a Biden administration undertaking. This will take just days, just days before the uh, Republican National Convention. Um, and for that reason, I think the Biden administration will take care to build in senior congressional representation, which I think is rather important. Um, and it will also attempt to uh, broaden the uh, discussion by bringing in uh, Republican thought leaders and others, really making this an American undertaking and effort, which is really in the spirit of what NATO summits have been in decades past. Moreover, I think the Biden team will lean in on the subject of burden sharing. Uh, in 2013, prior to President Putin's first intervention, the annexation of Crimea, in Ukraine, only, I think, three allied members uh, spent 2% of GDP on defense. Of course, there's the famous Wales Pledge from 2014, where Alliance members committed themselves to that. And uh, by the time of the summit, and we'll have a burden sharing report come out in June to give us more firm sense of this. Uh, senior administration officials, including Julie Smith, our ambassador to NATO, on the record this week, uh, thought we would end up somewhere between 20 to 23 allied members uh, hitting the 2% mark of GDP. So they will surely lean into this as an accomplishment and to try to address some of the criticisms that, in my view, justifiably so, have been made of Alliance members who have been laggards on defense spending. Um, there will also be a heavy focus on the DDA family of plans, which were blessed in Vilnius. These are the new battle plans to actually, if necessary, deter and then fight a war in the European theater. Uh, and that principally, of course, is aimed at the threat posed by Russia as spelled out in the strategic concept adopted in Madrid um, the year before. It also, um, I think, is an opportunity for uh, the alliance to think beyond Wales. Um, there are some concerns that allies, so as not to embarrass Joe Biden, will come to Washington for the summit and parade 2%, but there will almost be accounting tricks or they will, they will empty their coffers to hit 2%, but in out years, those numbers might lag again. So I think it'll be important to really make clear this is a permanent commitment and then uh, move beyond the 2% because virtually everyone uh, one speaks to in the alliance that deals with security issues, the analytical community in Europe and the United States recognizes that 2% probably is no longer enough. We might need to hit 2.5% or more. And the Nordics, the Eastern Europeans, the UK have made a commitment to that and they will be lauded for it uh, at the NATO summit. And lastly, the last uh, sort of threat to the summit, if we can put it that starkly, is the counter-programming that uh, will sure to take place um, in the Kremlin. We know that uh, Xi Jinping just had a swing through Europe. He purposely chose heading to France, Hungary, and Serbia as his three uh, uh, destinations of choice. I think in France, to accentuate strategic autonomy as a theme, uh, something which the Chinese have been sort of uh, in support of in recent years. In Hungary, as a new economic hub, almost as a Trojan horse of sorts within the alliance, and in Serbia, 
uh, which has also made some, um, some uh, uh, I think, um, rhetorical choices in recent years that give the Chinese hope that one can wedge the alliance uh, through Europe. So those are, I think, uh, a few areas that I would just mention, the importance of making this an American summit, the emphasis on burden sharing and actual spending, and lastly, counter-programming that we should be aware of. And in the category of counter-programming with, with President Putin, we already see the ongoing offensive around Kharkiv. There could be a push there. Or perhaps there'll be a new vector opened up where they try to attack Western supply lines um, from the north uh, in the coming months. Secondly, I would say the summit's going to be dominated uh, by the issue of Ukraine. And it's hard, it's hard to get around that topic. It really is, I think, the crucial issue. But the White House would like to badly avoid the public spat that we saw at Vilnius last year. And I think it will try to dampen down disagreements within the alliance on Ukraine, principally through two means. The first is uh, to try to convince those allies who are pushing for a more of a forward-leaning posture on Ukraine, that we need to show alliance solidarity as to convince Vladimir Putin that we are in it for the long haul. And then the second is they are already now lowering expectations. We just saw Tony Blinken in Kyiv. Uh, he gave an address at a university. And if you read between the lines, it's rather clear that uh, membership is not going to be in the cards for Ukraine at the summit. Uh, we've heard that explicitly um, in background conversations with senior administration officials in recent weeks. And again, on the record, uh, one or two senior administration officials have come out pretty bluntly and said, while well, negotiations are ongoing, there won't be a membership offer uh, made. Instead, I think they will try to generate a positive headline coming out of the G7 in Italy next month on windfall profits attached to the frozen uh, Russian funds. And then beyond that, try to wrap their deliverables at the NATO summit uh, as a as a, as a victory of sorts, as something that will constitute success. This is being described as a bridge to NATO. And that bridge to NATO will include these bilateral security agreements that were announced by the G7 at Vilnius and that various countries are negotiating with the Ukrainians. The administration will sell that as important. And the Americans are in the midst of those talks with the Ukrainians for the bilateral security agreement between the US and uh, Ukraine right now. Secondly, there will probably be a separate statement in addition to the uh, communique or declaration from the summit as part of the NATO-Ukraine Council. It will be the first time there's a NATO-Ukraine Council meeting um, at a NATO summit. Then there will be, I think, a big focus on interoperability, which we're already seeing. So how can Ukraine's military systems, as this money floods into their uh, defense industrial base, be built up so that's interoperable with the West? Um, right now, well, there's a lot of talk of Frankenstein-style systems because everyone is donating as part of the coalition in the Ramstein format to Ukraine what they have. And this is forcing the Ukrainians to really put together uh, systems with various components from different legacies and, and different points of origin. So how to make that more interoperable. And last, um, but certainly not least, there is talk of a potential NATO mission uh, to Ukraine, which is now being reported on also in the press. This could be in the category, for example, of training. Um, and then third, I would just highlight um, uh, to, to kind of sum up um, the NATO summit preview part of my remarks, the IP4, the Indo-Pacific 4, will be coming to the summit. This will be the third summit which they will have attended, the IP4, of course, being Japan, South Korea, Australia, and New Zealand. And I think while the administration and the broader uh, NATO watching community believe that their simple attendance at the first two summits was enough of a deliverable, they will want to move beyond that. And we've already seen, uh, for example, ROK, Korean Polish Defense Industrial Base Cooperation. The Japanese were at, uh, the, at NATO in Brussels a few months ago, briefing their own cybersecurity strategy. There is appetite and interest in making a big deliverable with the IP4 at the NATO summit. And I suspect there will be something announced to that effect there. So, so much for the NATO summit. Um, I know I've already gone on too long, but maybe I could make a remark or two also on um, the geopolitical setting as I see it. And here I really, uh, while I'm open to discussing anything in the QA and A, want to address uh, one particular facet, and that is the broadening of, um, of the conflict, so to speak, and that uh, there now really is an axis of revisionist forming in Eurasia uh, around this war. The Chinese, North Koreans, and the Iranians are really um, a significant factor and Russia's performance and Russia's defense industrial base reconstitution in this conflict. And uh, we've seen that in multiple ways. For one, the DPRK and Iran are supplying short range ballistic missiles uh, to Russia. Uh, we've seen in the DPRK um, massive ammunition stores being supplied uh, to Russia, according to South Korean intelligence. And I think widely accepted as true, probably millions of rounds 
Uh, it may very well be that the North Koreans have provided with Russia, despite being a measly, paltry economy, more ammunition round support than Europe has uh, to Ukraine since the start of this war. And I think that's a, a rather stunning statement given the size and scope of the European economy. Uh, moreover, the Iranians have been instrumental in uh, providing Russia with a drone capability. There's now a, a joint facility established in Tatarstan uh, where Russia is developing large numbers of drones based on the Shahid model, which the Iranians pioneered. This has played a, a crucial role uh, in the war uh, in Ukraine. And I think what is uh, sometimes overlooked is that these are not just one-way transactions. We should ask ourselves, what are the Iranians and the North Koreans getting in return? Uh, and here, for example, uh, it's notable that prior to President Putin and President Kim's meeting in September of 2023 in the Far East, uh, North Korea had failed in multiple space launch vehicle attempts. After that visit, uh, North Korea managed to successfully put a satellite um, into space. And I think there's a lot of speculation, including from uh, the South Korean side, that uh, Russian expertise in this area has proved decisive. For the Iranians, um, the drone cooperation also goes two ways. The Iranians have supplied Russia with large uh, numbers of drones, but now the Russians are perfecting and advancing and improving uh, those drones, and Iran will benefit from that. There's talk of an upgrade of Iranian um, missile defense systems. They have S-300s, which are Russian origin. Perhaps they'll get S-400s. They want advanced Russian fighters. You can imagine how this rings alarm bells in Jerusalem when we talk about an upgrading of Iran's missile defense system and a new fighter jet capability, just as Iran sprints to the nuclear threshold. So again, uh, we are um, really in an era where the defense partnership between Russia, the DPRK, and uh, Iran is potentially upgrading those rogue nations' defense military bases in an unprecedented fashion, in a scope and speed uh, that we haven't seen before in decades. There was just recently, for example, a DPRK scientific delegation in Moscow. All of that, I think, should worry us tremendously. And then there is the PRC, which, of course, how could we not quickly make a point about that, given uh, that President Putin is in uh, Beijing and now traveling onward to meet with his Chinese counterpart. Chinese-Russian trade has exploded um, over the past year to $240 billion in two-way trade, far surpassing any goals that she and Putin had set for the two-way trading relationship. Um, this uh, has has uh, signified a growth of some 25 percent from 2022 um, and almost 50 percent uh, or 60 percent over 2021 levels. So huge advances in trade. And these are in dual use and commercial uh, technologies and goods that are really important to the Russian war effort. Everything from ball bearings to navigation equipment. Uh, my colleagues at the Center for Strategic and International Studies have a good report out on this issue, a variety of components, machine tools, microelectronics that matter um, for the Russian war effort. And as Chris Cavoli Sackier testified before the House Armed Services Committee in, uh, I think, a month ago, Russian reconstitution is taking place much quicker um, than any of us would have imagined because of the huge Chinese industrial and economic um, support. They are the, the customers for uh, Russian oil that really um, have allowed Russia to sustain both revenues, which in turn fund um, its war effort and outright military kit uh, uh, there. So um, with that, I'll just say on um, sanctions enforcement, I think the administration is trying to counteract this through four primary methods. The first is classic export controls. So controlling the items that are actually going to um, the Russians. The sex second is that they're targeting payment systems. Um, and here we saw an executive order by President Biden in December that is meant to have a chilling effect on payment systems and uh, increasing talk of sanctions, including a, uh, a recent sanctions items against companies active, 10 uh, companies and 12 individuals in Belarus, including um, the Shenzhen uh, a company that, of course, has Chinese ties. And this is attempting to, I think, crack down on the, on the payment processes and systems that are utilized for two-way trade. Third is pressure on the PRC. We saw Secretary Yellen and Blinken in China recently, and Secretary Blinken publicly said he communicated to the Chinese, if you don't um, address this issue of sanctions evasion, we will, which is a rather stark message. And then the final, of course, is Ukraine's military attacks. Um, Ukraine is degrading um, Russia's um, military in Ukraine and also some of its um, sources of revenue in Russia itself. And so those four means are, are ways the administration hopes to uh, uh, get at this issue. With that, I will just um, uh, stop and uh, turn it over to questions about this or anything else that you all would like to address. Thanks very much.
Thank you for those remarks, Mr. Rowe. And now I would like to open it up for questions. We will first start with questions in the room. If you called on, please introduce yourself before your question. And a reminder for journalists joining us via Zoom, please be sure your screen name includes your name, outlet, and country. And with that, first row, please. Thank you. Uh, Annette Meiritz, Handelsblatt, uh, thank you for, for the remarks. So these bad actor, uh, actor corporations you talked about, um, Biden's promise to the world is democracy against authoritarianism. Do you see already that he failed in that promise? And to what extent um, is the current administration partially responsible for that? Well, I think that uh, coming into office, Biden very much so held fast to this framing democracy versus autocracy. And through the democracy summits, he's tried to implement and execute that agenda. But I think on the issues that matter, um, much of that agenda has been left behind. There has been a, a turn in the, the Biden administration's attitudes towards Saudi Arabia, which I think is one of the best examples of this. So when it comes to the Saudis, initially they gave uh, Riyadh the cold shoulder rather famously after the Khashoggi a finding, which they publicized the Biden administration intentionally. And now they are working very closely hand in glove with the Saudis on a new uh, uh, regional order in Gaza post um, post um, uh, post the Israeli operation. Um, they've shown little to no embarrassment in working with um, uh, the Chinese on areas they think are fruitful or necessary for cooperation, for example, climate change. And uh, they uh, sought to selectively engage uh, Russia from the very beginning, including that famous summit with Vladimir Putin in Geneva in the summer of 2021. So um, I think there's been a, a rhetorical sort of rallying theme of authoritarianism versus authoritarianism, but uh, in, ex in execution, I, I don't think that um, that's always been characteristic of the administration's approach. They've wanted from the very start to get back into a, a JCPOA 2.0 with the Iranians, for example. And while that policy has failed and is in, in tatters right now, um, uh, they sought that cooperation from the very start, even when the president was was making those arguments. So um, I, I think I, I view this as a, as a rhetorical rallying ca uh, cry, but not really um, imprinted on the administration's actual actions. Thank you. I'll go next to Olga. My name is Olga Koshlenko. I am a um, journalist with the One Plus One Media Ukraine. You have already mentioned uh, that uh, NATO membership for Ukraine is not under consideration. What is the most significant outcome Ukrainian leadership would achieve at this uh, summit? And uh, secondly, uh, American leadership consist consistently says that uh, they are not going to send any American troops, including instructors, to Ukraine. Could this point be reconsidered at this summit? Well, General Brown, uh, I think in the New York Times today, if I have it right, uh, characterized a NATO mission or a training program for Ukraine as inevitable. So it may very well come at some point and it may very well be up for consideration. But to date, that is obviously a decision for the president. It's a political decision and um, it, it has not been revised. So uh, American forces are not in, in Ukraine. But um, if that report is uh, at all to be believed and well sourced, then um, perhaps it'll be up for consideration at some point. Um, but, you know, uh, I think the administration is making a mistake in not considering um, NATO membership for Ukraine conditions permitting, which is to say one can offer membership um, for accession talks. Um, President Zelensky himself has said he recognizes Ukraine will not get into NATO so long as there is an active war in the country. And so one could offer membership um, to Ukraine um, with the caveat that membership will not take place until all the allies agree uh, that the conditions are ready for it. This is a proposal that my colleague Luke Coffey has made in front of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, Europe subcommittee. He and I have also made it in a report, which we can pull up at Hudson.org called A Strategy of Courage. And in general, perhaps to go off on a slight digression, I would like to see the administration show a little bit more courage on these issues. It uh, uh, does not stand to reason to me why, when the Russians are prosecuting an offensive um, from Russian territory on Ukraine's second city, which sits mere miles from the border, Ukraine is handcuffed from using Western systems to strike Russian industrial supply and advanced units that are massing on the other side of the border. So long as Russians can sunbathe in Russia, um, can build up their war kit there before crossing into Ukraine, 
um, to fight Ukraine. So long as that is the case, we should, we should not um, be surprised if Ukraine has difficulties and challenges um, on, on, the, on the battlefield. On the one hand, we expect them to break through and bathe in the Sea of Azov in their first counteroffensive. But in the next breath, we're telling them all the things they can't do and restricting them. So I think in general, the attitude here has to be much more competitive with the Russians. It has to be much more um, aggressive in that sense, rather than uh, restrictive and I think tepid and incremental, which is, to my thinking, a recipe for uh, a recipe for a failure. Uh, gentlemen. Hamdi uh, Saleh from Asia, Asia Communities. You talked about the connection between, you know, the what's happening in Iran and the alliance with the, the Chinese and so on. But uh, what, uh, what we can see is that there is a link between the war in Ukraine and what's happening in the Middle East. And the, I guess, uh, the supplies of uh, military equipment and so on is really in a problem, uh, facing a problem in terms of supply on both sides. Do you think the NATO conference uh, will have time to discuss what is going on in the Middle East and how to pacify this particular region, particularly in, in view of the, uh, the fact that, you know, the, the Arab summit, which was convened in Panama, Bahrain, called for a peace conference. Do you think there is a possibility of having at least uh, what you call a panel to discuss what could be done to really pacify the region? Well, for starters, I would say that the Russian-Iranian alliance, and I would characterize it as an alliance, despite their differences, was born in the Middle East. Qasem Soleimani famously went to Moscow when Bashar Assad's forces were beginning to collapse in Syria, brought the Russians in, and the Russians established themselves uh, under the cover of the JCPOA, which kind of, uh, I think, um, <clears throat> caused the Americans to... to uh, um, uh, uh, to, to look at the uh, region, I think, rather naively, or it was the vehicle through that. The Russians established themselves in Latakia. Uh, they established an air base and a naval contingent, and they acted as the air force for the IRGC ground forces that um, backed Bashar Assad's troops and destroyed the Syrian opposition. That was really the starting point um, for this coalition, which has now expanded to the Ukrainian battlefront, where, as I said, with drone and ballistic missile transfers across the Caspian, the Iranians are reinforcing Iran. So there is a Middle East connection in the sense that this relationship, this alignment, and even outright alliance began years ago and is now um, is now um, uh, uh, playing itself out in Europe. I have not heard, and I would be surprised um, if this were on the agenda, that the Middle East is going to factor in the NATO summit. Events notwithstanding, there could be a major cataclysmic event of one sort or another that intervenes and forces it on the agenda. But um, Russia will be the top issue. Terrorism will be an important topic. Um, Turkey has consistently insisted that this remain a, a, a topic on the agenda. And of course, it is listed in the strategic concept as the second threat, so to speak, uh, to the alliance in the order of the paragraphs from the strategic concept that was adopted at Madrid. I think China will come up, climate change, readiness. Uh, these are some of the topics, but I have yet to hear Gaza, uh, the war um, um, in the Middle East come up in that way. Um, so uh, yeah, it's, it's, un, it's, uh, uncertain to me that it, it's unclear to me that how, and, and if it would come up, please. Yeah. See, thank you. Um, I have another question on Ukraine. So you already mentioned the G7 group, but there are going to be like, a few other events, uh, lined up in, in June, there's a time when you can stop in Europe and then Ukraine conference in Berlin, uh, for the G7, then the Ukraine conference in Switzerland after the G7. So I wanted to ask you if you could elaborate a little bit more what you were expecting, like precise outcomes of those series of events uh, at the beginning of, of, of June, including the G7 there in terms of, of, of Ukraine. Because that's going to be a big problem uh, all over next. I think the um, outcome from the Switzerland meeting will be to show the world that there really is only one peace plan on the table, and that is President Zelensky's. Um, Andrei Yermak came to Hudson Institute last year. He presented the, uh, the, the uh, I think it is 10-point plan um, for Ukraine at that session. Um, and <clears throat> I think it's, uh, it's meant to uh, show the world that um, Ukraine um, has a plan, and um, it's to show the world that Russia is isolated, given the number of attendees that are expected in Switzerland. I also think that each of the principles that undergird the Ukraine plan, the Zelensky plan, if you want to call it that, for the war, have 
broad backing in international law or in general assembly resolutions or even in UN Security Council resolutions. So the principles are, um, are I think, relatively accepted. And hammering that home, drawing attention to it has been, I think, the goal each step of the way since um, this was rolled out at each of the meetings and Switzerland being the latest. As for the Berlin meeting, um, I'm not sure I have too much to add. Obviously, um, they will be working out the... Um, the economic needs both now for Ukraine, but also when reconstruction eventually comes. So how does one build in a private sector component? This is a German American initiative that's relatively new. That'll also feature, I think, at the Berlin meeting. And um, um, connected to that, of course, is the is the G7 discussion around uh, windfall profits. And that debate is still alive um, and, um, and still raging or still ongoing, I should say, perhaps raging doing it too starkly. But there are some disagreements, um, as I read it from public press reporting within the G7, on how to deal with Russia's sovereign assets, which are um, frozen in Europe and the United States. And um, I would suspect that they want to drive towards an uh, announcement on that at the G7 in Italy. Pavel. Hello, Novak. Czech Radio. Uh, NATO has a tool which is called the Membership Action Plan. So it's a roadmap uh, leading to uh, the future membership without guarantee that uh, uh, that uh, state will be uh, will be adopted as a as a member. But so, do you think that uh, this plan, providing this plan to Ukraine, is a far distant uh, future for Kyiv? And if I may, second question about Trump and his worrying that maybe United States won't respect uh, Article Five in case that the European partners are not responsible and they are not uh, paying uh, that uh, two percent of GDP uh, for uh, for defense. So I think that everybody will come here and will declare, yes, we are fulfilling that this benchmark. So is it just rhetoric? Is it just show before elections? Or do you think that Trump would uh, fulfill such such warning in case of some deterioration situation in, in Europe? Well, on the membership action plan, that was one of the deliverables from the Vilnius summit was to lift MAP for Ukraine. So the Ukrainians did not need to go through the MAP process, just as Sweden and Finland did not either. Um, the NATO uh, Ukraine Council was another of the major deliverables. And I think that's part of the issue for the Washington summit. The low hanging fruit has been plucked, so, so to speak. Uh, the obvious deliverables have already been offered to Ukraine. So now what is the next step? It's a bit like the IP4 issue I just described. Their mere attendance at Madrid and Vilnius was accomplishment enough. But now at Washington, they're looking to take the next step to justify their presence and to make it a relevant um, agenda item. And so I think we'll see an announcement on IP4. And in the case of Ukraine's NATO aspirations, I've laid out some of the ways that they'll hope to bridge, to use the word that the administration uh, likes to employ, Ukraine's expectations with um, where Washington and, quite frankly, Berlin stand on this issue. And that will include potentially a NATO mission to Ukraine as a deliverable to overcome differences on um, actual membership. But it'll include a work towards interoperability of some sort. It'll include a statement on the NATO-Ukraine Council, and it might include more announcements on bilateral security agreements. As to your second question on President Trump, <clears throat> uh, not all countries will come to uh, Washington and say that they've met the 2% threshold. I don't think the Canadians uh, are going to hit the 2% threshold or come to Washington saying that they uh, are on the cusp of uh, hitting the 2% threshold. In fact, Ottawa has been um, a, a challenge on this front for years and um, uh, one of the most obstreperous members of the alliance when it comes to meeting their defense spending uh, obligations. So if we do hit, in the best case scenario, 22 or 23 total members, uh, re remember there are 32 uh, allies uh, in the alliance. So that leaves um, almost double digits, if not more than double digits, so more than 10 uh, members who won't be able to hit that. Um, I can't um, uh, take you inside of Donald Trump's mind um, any more than anyone else can, but uh, I generally view his statements as, um, as, as anchoring points to try to nudge, cajole, and pressure allies to increase their defense spending so that there is more burden sharing in the alliance. And I think that's one of the reasons looming over the summit, um, the Republican National Convention, why burden sharing will be a key point to focus and the improvements in alliance spending to date. So some will say, let's celebrate the increased performance of the alliance, more spending. 
And others might uh, say, yes, there's more spending, but um, we've now turned need to turn commitments into capabilities and capabilities into war fighting ability. And so long as we have not done that, uh, we still have a lot of work to do. So it really depends on where you want to put your focus. And I think President Trump will continue to cajole, uh, will continue to push, will continue to pressure until the alliance gets to a place where it's totally fit for purpose, where it can take General Cavoli's uh, DDA family of plans and say, each of us has our uh, responsibilities, each of us has our assignments, and we can fulfill those 100%. We'll take a question from Zoom now. Alex, please unmute yourself. Hey, Zina, thank you so much for doing this. Uh, this is Alex Rafolu from Tran News Agency. Um, I will follow up on the question on uh, NATO membership. Thank you so much again for uh, making it clear um, about what is what, what, what was the thinking process, you know, in, in Washington prior to the summit. But we heard from the secretary in Kiev. I I, I thought he uh, well, he used a metaphor, but he uh, was talking about sort of giving a strong uh, bridge to NATO, and and he said it should be strong and well lit. Um, I, now, it's only a metaphor, but what can be done with it in your understanding if the US means it? Uh, if you talk to the expert community, they, they would say that the point of giving Ukraine a clear perspective to, of NATO membership and not tying it you know, to an end of the war would be an important signal in an effort to make Russia change its calculation you know, on, on whether the war is worth it. If, if you subscribe to that, to that uh, analysis, uh, to, uh, to, I won't ask about that. And secondly, um, how much of Georgia's backsliding from uh, European past and recent events in Georgia, you know, presumably orchestrated by Russia, adds up to the urgency of you know this NATO membership conversation, whether it's about Georgia or Ukraine or the other countries? Thank you so much. Well, just to begin with the membership point, to reiterate my own position, I do think that at the summit, it would be wise to offer Ukraine membership with the final date of accession to be determined when all of the allied members believe that security conditions allow it. So that caveat, I think, is about to reality. President Zelensky himself has said on multiple occasions that Ukraine will not enter the alliance while the war is raging in his country. He recognizes this. At the same time, it makes clear that uh, the West will not give up on Ukraine, that Ukraine's future is in NATO. And even a statement that says Ukraine's uh, future is in NATO, and there is no doubt that there'll be uh, language like that adopted in Washington, um, is not the same thing as actually offering um, membership um, at, for uh, membership to accession talks to, to whatever date is eventually decided. So I think there is a meaningful distinction there um, between saying, like we have since 2008 at the Bucharest summit, that we'd like to invite uh, Ukraine into NATO, almost a rote regurgitation of language which have adopted each summit and has almost lost some of its meaning, versus taking that next step um, to, uh, to membership at whatever date eventually uh, is decided on. So I think that is meaningful. I think um, <clears throat> Anders Fogh Rasmussen just came out with a new proposal that uh, includes, I think, a similar element to it. He also has an, uh, a no later date than uh, stipulation, I think, as part of his plan. So these are all some of the creative juices flowing when it comes to what eventually should be offered um, at um, the summit in Washington. As to Georgia, I think um, the situation in, in Georgia, uh, much like the si situation in um, the Caucasus writ large and in the post-Soviet states of the Black Sea, Moldova, um, uh, springs to mind, Ukraine to a certain extent as well, is entirely dependent on um, Russian power. Um, and when Russia is beat back in Ukraine, it's the number one thing that can be done to weaken Russia's influence in Central Asia, weaken its influence in the Caucasus on both sides of the Caspian, weaken its influence in um, Ukraine, quite obviously, uh, and literally, but also in, in a place like Moldova. And so um, the number one thing that the West can do is to back the um, back the um, uh, Ukrainians and empower them to achieve gains on the battlefield. I also have to confess, I was a little disappointed by what I thought was a milquetoast uh, original, initial statement um, on the Georgia situation um, from our own government. I think a more robust and quick move to sanctions, which should have been teed up and ready, would have been a wiser policy option. 
thereby um, um, preempting, I think, some of the problems that we've seen over the past week when the Georgian authorities have almost committed themselves to a course that's difficult, um, even with American pressure, to get them to reverse. But um, uh, I'll leave it at that. Any other questions? I don't see any other questions, neither online nor in person. Um, would you like to offer closing remarks? That's okay. All right. Then with this, um, thank you so much uh, to uh, Mr. Rowe for your briefing, for briefing us today. Thank you to journalists for joining us. Uh, this concludes today's briefing. Thanks.